I was just reflecting that it was about a year ago that I was first here for the launch of the Launch Lab. Um, and so it's great to be back, see all the changes that are happening and hear about changes still coming. Um, today, I was asked to give a topic for a talk to a room full of people who are full of talent. And my personal credo is never waste a drop of talent. So then I, I stopped and I looked at all my normal talks and I said, no, no, no think about this, you know. So I said, okay, well, let's talk about 10 years of experience coding, accompanying, and creating tech. Because, you know, we're all students. I was a student, right? 10 years ago, I was a student. We just finished being a student. So who here is still studying? Who here has recently graduated? And anyone have a business already? Cool. And everybody, anybody intending to make a business? Cool. Um, so about 10 years ago, I was really, really wanting to make a business. And um, I was full of ideas. And I'd spent the last four years cramming my head full of engineering ideas. I'd spent, since I was five, learning how to code and do computers and all this jazz. So if I think about what I'd say to myself back then, I wouldn't give you more like theory and facts and stuff. There's too much of that. So today I'm just going to share a few stories, just with some insights from those stories. Um, and they're going to be really gritty, um, like real what went wrong, and then hopefully, hopefully some of it sticks. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off the projector, and I'm going to talk to the whiteboard, or to the flip chart, um, because there's tons of tech, right? We're, just, we're washed in tech. I'm going to just slow down for a bit, tell you guys stories, you can think, chill, this isn't going to be like high information delivery, but maybe one or two of these things will stick today, and it'll be worth your time, and worth my time. So, I know we live in a, in a new world, but most of you have probably seen a hardcover notebook, right? And then they get the echte hardcover notebook, which is like red, with the leather print on it, and it's got the gold embossing on the front. Anyone familiar with those? Maybe seen them on some old person's desk or something. <laughs> so when I was at this stage, I, w I went off to work for an airline in the UK and I helped them change manage in their crewing software and because they were working on whiteboards and they'd scaled beyond the point where the whiteboards would really work and they needed software, so I helped them do that. And then we were toasting ourselves on the success of this and I walked across the hall to uh, commercial. Because the commercial guys, like they're in sales, right? Sales is stressful. These guys are like, ah, sit there and they smoke like chimneys, you go outside. There's, one of them actually smoked, was outside so much he got hit by an apple falling out of the apple tree standing outside. He was just sitting there all the time. Like, so the odds, he, he ran the odds and actually got hit by an apple. Um, so I was like, okay, let's see how they do their business because it must be really jacked. They're the driving end of the company. And I went in there and what did I find? A red book. They were running the commercials of the company on, in these red books. Every flight that was going out went out on a red book. You write the flight number in the corner, you write your estimates in there, you write what the cargo is going to be, and each page was for a flight. I was disgusted. I've just been doing this thing for crewing, and I've just got an engineering degree. I can't seriously think. I was like, okay, cool, let me, let me be the bigger person and ask them if they're having problems, because clearly. And yes, they were having problems, you know. They said, no, we, we're struggling because sometimes you'll send an email with a quote and it doesn't actually come in here. Sometimes what will happen is uh, you'll forget to put the cargo on there and then we'll misquote and we'll lose a few thousand dollars. I'm like, oh, this is, this is terrible. So I put on my best shirt for the day and go out to the board. And I'm like, okay. I, I, I took this time in this meeting to say to you, what we really need to do is for the commercial department, we need to build some software. Yeah, chum, you're right. The problem is, we can't afford to build the software in the UK, because I was in the UK at the time. It's just too expensive. Software is too expensive to build. And if we tried to do it internally, no, no disrespect to me and the rest of the IT team, it would never get finished, because it's inside of the company. So yeah, you, know, you get a bit downhearted, and it's like, but this software needs to exist. And as mentioned, I share with some of you the fact that I'm a little bit entrepreneurial and I wanted to do something. And so I saw my opportunity and I was like, I come from South Africa. I've got student friends. We can build this thing. So I went to the board and I was like, well, what we could do is 
I want to make a company. Let me go back to the South Africa, get a contract from you guys, build the software, bring it back, and solve commercial problems. And they said to me, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, quickly I pick up the phone, phone my old best friend from high school. He's got some job in South Africa at the time, which I still don't know what it was, but I didn't care. I was like, we, we're going to do this. We're going to make a company. We've got our first contract. Let's go. Let's build. And so we, we wrote the contract and it said, you know, we'll work for this long, we'll deliver it then, we'd like to talk to you often about what we're going to do. We were really optimistic and it was great. Um, idealistic, optimistic, you know, but that's where we were. We really, really wanted to do it. And we coded and we checked it with the customer and we wrote a nice spec and we said, well, the Red Book does this, we're going to do this. And we tried to reconcile all the features and everything that needed to happen. And sure enough, Time went on, we flew to the UK with the finished software, a couple of days before schedule, it was just amazing. And we arrived there, we installed the software, showed everyone how it worked, they said, wow, this actually matches what we wanted, you know, this is great. Um, everyone was surprised, including us, because, you know, you start out with a bit of worry. And then the day before we launched, um, someone was like, well, just explain to me how these numbers come about. And now we were like a you know, stepped up. And said, well, so what happens is you've got these airplanes, right? They fly all over the world, but we found out when we tried to model them that you can't model airplanes, you have to model engines because the performance of the fuel, which is the thing that drives the price of the company, is based on the engines on the aircraft and the routes. So what we did was we actually, luckily they had enough data that we could track where each engine was flying and track the performance of each cluster of engines on each flight and come up with a model which when you ran it against the data very accurately predicted the real prices. Some of you have glazed over already and these guys have completely glazed over at that point. You know, those are commercial guys. But they were fine, they were like, wow, these numbers are good. And then the head of commercial, the, the guy who got hit on the head with Apple, um, says to me, cool, this is, this is really nice. But could you make it pull the numbers that Ops does from Jefferson? Uh, the flight planning system, because we'd like to just be able to see those numbers too, because at the moment we have to go and op ask Ops for that. And we're like, cool. So the night before we sit, we hackly hackly hack. Um, we find out that Jeppesen uses an HTTP uh, RESTful, maybe the way to describe it, API. So we just called into that and we found, well, they had a license, so it wasn't illegal or anything. So we pulled the data in and we showed it on our system. So you could quickly put in the, all the flight costings and boom, you'd see it coming out of there. Cool, we shipped that. And everyone was happy. Now, this isn't, this isn't a, a fairy tale gone wrong yet. And so then, then what happened? Then we flew back to Cape Town. Then the money arrived in our bank accounts. Then we went to Kennedy's and bought cigars, and we smoked cigars, and we felt pretty good. You know, we'd succeeded. That was the first thing we did, we succeeded at. And then we got to wondering, like, is anyone really using it? So we phoned up James, the guy who got in the head of Apple. How's it going? He's like, oh, the system's fantastic. We're loving it. It's great. Cool. Do you mind if we log in and check out? Yeah. Cool. We logged in and you know we built a system that you could model what the freight would be, and we built a system that you could put the trips in, and you could actually put the cargo on the trips and send the email to Ops and send it. So we didn't see any of that in the database. The, the data, they hadn't been capturing this. And we were like, oh, we must have made a mistake looking at the wrong database. And we carried on doing what other we were doing. Um, we called back, yeah, it's still fantastic. But, you know, so it was working, so they didn't contact us. We had to contact them. So again, yeah, we were happy. Um, then then it, something broke. And we got a call from the IT department that time. Hi, the system you made to pull the Jefferson numbers isn't working. System. Oh, the Jepson, the thing we did on the last day. Okay, cool. Let's go back and oh, the Jepson password had changed. We fixed that back online. Commercial send us an email. Great, we're so happy the system's working again. They actually send us an email to say it's working. So then, then I conspired to get on a plane and go over there and see what's happening. And there they were sitting, perfectly happy. Quick costing page, the one before even the first page, just the little test page that we built. Enter the flight numbers, click the Jepson number, get the Jepson numbers, and write them into the paper red book. Again, I was horrified. But then I spoke to 
James, he said, it's amazing. It saves us walking across the hall. We used to have to walk across the hall, ask ops, they're stressed, interrupt operations, get the jets, and come back here, put it on our desk. Your system was amazing. And it, it delivered exactly what we wanted. That, it's, it simplified our lives. It made everything better. You were right. <laughs> but you're not using it. And so, uh, yeah, the board again, asking them about, everyone was happy. It's kind of the employee had no clothes on, but everyone was happy. And that's when I re first time I realized that there's very little link between effort and value. We'd spent a few months building this thing, slaving away, specking it up, figuring out the right thing we thought to build. But the thing we'd built, literally it was like three hours the day before, whacked in the Jefferson thing, gave them all the value of the contract. I could have buggered off for three months, done nothing, gone there, written three hours of code and build them for it. But I don't know how to build people for that much, you know, for three hours of code. So I would never have done that. And that brings me first principle, I promised you principles, is coders got a code, right? Who here codes? Who here hacks? And by hack I don't mean malicious, I mean clutch things together to make them work quickly. Yeah, so folks, right? Who has engineering? Engineers build, or they engineer. But we, we have the thing we have to do. So coders are going to code. I was a coder. I did lots of code because that's the thing I could do. So to get rid of this idea, and we presented with another idea that who's heard build, measure, learn before? So we'll go through it really briefly. I had pressed it. It's probably stuck to my jacket now. No? No? no. There's apparently some press stick here somewhere. No? Okay. You'll have to remember. Cool. So, so there's three parts to build, measure, learn. And um, who had a science degree? You had a degree in a department that includes science or engineering or something in its name. Okay. Arts degrees? Business degrees? Cool. No degrees? Okay. Cool. No degrees. Excellent. University of Life. Um, <laughs> so the, the funny thing about science is it's just learning, right? Scientific method. Can anyone tell me what the scientific method is? No? Hypothesis. Yeah, and then? Test it. Yeah. Cool. So, this is just science. Put the other way around, right? We build something, we check out what's happening, we learn about it, we see what we want to build, and we've got this cycle of build, measure, learn that happens. What we did was we built for a long time. We shipped it. We had no way of really measuring it until eventually I got over there and looked at it, and then I learned what they actually wanted. So the, the core insight out of that for me is that we need to do all three of these things. But coders are going to code, right? So we have to stop. There's no coding here. And there's no coding here. Just slow down, turn off the tech for a bit, and just go, okay, let's go and look at what real people are doing with what we're doing. And let's go and learn, which also involves not coding. It's hard. Because it's the easiest flipping thing in the world to be where you're at home. Right? I, I learned to interact with the world through my computer. The kids that I teach in my coder dojo are even worse than me. They're 8 to 14 year olds of today. They, 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 you, you have to ask them to turn the iPad upside down to actually have a finished conversation with them because this is a place where they're allowed to code and play Minecraft and do stuff at my office. And like, what? I can't talk to you now. I'm coding. Um, so measuring and learning is really what we build what we need to build into this space. But, first project, successful. Woohoo! You know, everyone thought it was successful. I thought it was a failure, but the money came in, the clients were happy. Yeah, it's good. So time went on, and eventually we happened on the big deal. I remember the day of the big deal very clear clearly because I was working on a mine at the time. It was pretty dusty. Blue tin roof. We were contracting there. It was a big, the big deal for us was first getting to the mine, but now that we're at the mine, now the project manager comes to me. It's like, we're wrapping up here, but um, is the dream project coming up now? It's with Microsoft. Aww. 
The specs have all been written, they know what they want. It's just time to sit down and do the dev. And then we're gonna, we were in September, and we're gonna ship it at Christmas. Three months of just joining a team and... <laughs> so, woohoo, off I went. Ding, 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 ding. We interviewed over the phone, they asked us hard questions, and we answered them right. And then our company got asked to go and join this team. And so, there we go. And how many folks are we in this room, approximately? 24, 5, 20. It was about the team size, right? So I got there and they had a nice flip chart, just like this one. And they had grids drawn. These are the silos and these are the layers. So we had like business objects, uh, UI business objects, um, the web services, SQL queries, database schema. And this was media, maintenance, uh, finance. I can't really tell you the details of the project just to protect the innocent. But it, let's call it big deal at the moment. If you knew the project, you'd realize it's quite close to the project name, but that doesn't matter. Um, so we had all of these. And in each cell, there was a name. And my name was in one of these cells. I was in media database somewhere. So everyone was told, you work in this cell, and that's how we're going to make it work. So I'm media database. And uh, they're like, here's your spec. Can you write this much paper? It was like 120 pages of spec for this thing. Thankfully, I can say I never read the whole thing, still to this day. Um, but I paged to the bit that I was supposed to be working on first, which was like sizing the tapes. Cool. The tape size will be in the drop down. Google tape sizes. Ooh, there's a lot of them. All across the library, all the tapes look the same. Go to the project manager. Can I go and ask the library what tape size we should be using? No. Specs have been written. We figured it out. We need to build it now. Okay? <laughs> Everyone in the media stack come together. So these are all the tape sizes, but there's only one in the library. Um, what do we do? Ah, oh, well, let's design this generic system that can handle any tape size. I was young. I was idealistic. I was like, no, seriously? So I went down. I bought a cappuccino and I looked rather idle and I hung out outside the library until I met the guy. Ridwan was his name, he worked in the library, he came out and I was like, hey, how are you doing? Can I buy you coffee? I was like, yeah? Who are you? Oh, don't worry, don't worry, I just, I'm just interested in the library, you know, I'm an intern here. Okay, cool. So off we go to the cappuccino shop and I buy my cappuccino and I'm like, the tapes are usually, he's like, yeah, better max 83. Oh, perfect. Yeah, um, is that the only tape? Yeah, but we're introducing this new digital format. Oh, that's not my spec either. Okay, cool. No, okay, cool. It's so wonderful. Anyway, I go back upstairs and I'm like, guys, I have the truth. From the horse's mouth, that's the tape we're going to use. Um, I just didn't tell too many people how I got it because I would have got in trouble. And it just seemed dumb. Anyway, I was young, I was idealistic, and I was kind of, hmm, what would we say, anarchistic. So we had this structure, and I kept going, this is, let me figure this out. And while my friends who were down here on the stack in the SQL layer were sitting outside just drinking coffee because, well, there was nothing to do on that schema anymore, it had been defined, but I was told to work in that block, so I'm going to work in that block. Okay? You don't work for my company, I can't help you see the error in your ways, but those of us who did work in my company quickly found that we were being invited to the breakfast meetings with the CEOs and stuff because we were the ones who knew what was going on, and we were the ones who cared, and we could get it going. So then we found ourselves actually running this project. And you know, it sort of goes, oh, God, because you look at the project and it was supposed to be three months. <coughs> About a year later, we're running the project. <laughs> um, the end is not in sight. Um, but we have fabulous specs and everyone knows that the specs do not match what they need anymore. And <coughs> I get quite worried that project managers, the one who had a, what do you call it, nervous breakdown. <laughs> Second one got lucky, she got pregnant. Um, <laughs> so then there's a third one on there. There's a great guy called Gary. And I said, Gary, this, this, this is the problem. This spec doesn't make sense. He's like, there's a solution. It's called 1.1. And 
We can't ship 1.0, I said, no, there's no point in finishing that one. I said, okay, let's get business to agree, 1.1, we'll have a cutoff date. And that was fantastic. Like, we were allowed to change stuff. I no longer had to make the thing with all the possible tape sizes in the world, because there was only one, I no longer had a drop down that could just skip that screen completely, and people were happy. And slowly we built a system, talked to the users, and figured out version 1.1. And we found agreement, and board meetings went through, and everyone signed off. 1.1 was good. 1.1 was great, actually. And the guy in the library became a good friend of mine, found out I wasn't an intern, and um, then we parallel run, and he was like using it. And every day he'd ask me, okay, Dave, when do we sign it? When do we get to use the software? I'm very keen. And the finance guys, I got very good, very, I got very good friends with them too. Also other cappuccinos, a lot of cappuccino. Um, was so you have to control your weights to when you're buying that much cappuccino. You can't have the chocolatinos even though they're really nice. And so met these guys, they were all like, okay, cool, this is good. And then there was this there's one type of content that couldn't be scheduled. Um, because they had a special way. And it could be, but it wasn't easy. And then we realized that there was a better way of doing things. And then and then we realized that some of the departments in the company didn't use real exchange rates, they used their virtual exchange rates based on the contracts they signed. So we put those two things and we said, look, those are fundamental changes, let's put those into version 2, cool, leave them for the future, let's ship 1.1. Everyone had signed off 1.1 and they said, okay, we need to do 2.0. Um, so, you know, happy days. We had a launch party and everything. Didn't really launch yet because I was getting some stuff sorted. Um, and in those days, I was feeling really good. And because you're feeling really good, I've got a girlfriend. <laughs> Great! I met this girl in Joburg. And I was like, oh, awesome. You know, I'm a successful software guy. But I'm just going to Cape Town for a short while because they're busy renegotiating our contracts. I can come back and do version two of this amazing project with Microsoft. And um, Skype was early days then. But yeah, Skype to, uh, hi, how are you doing? You're oh, coming back soon. Just waiting to hear. So it was about a month later that I flew myself back up to Joburg to have a date with her to say, listen, I'm not going to do a long distance relationship. Like, it was really good to meet you, but I've just, my last girlfriend moved to California. I'm not going to do long distance relationship. Um, let's wait till this deal resolves, and if it does. So the deal never came off. Version 2 never came around. Version 1.1 never shipped. It was ready. Everyone wanted it, but there were a few changes. But the contract fell apart. So, so that's hard, right? It's hard for me, like two years of my life, defining moments, working 280, 300 hour months sometimes, yeah, before I had the girlfriend. And, um, because I bought a house that was 900, I, I rented a flat that was 980 meters from work, so I could just come in and keep grinding away. And then didn't go live. On the drive here, I was actually realizing something I'd never realized before. Is that if I'm lucky, the code that we worked on is still sitting on a piece of spinning rust somewhere in a data center. But I've spoken to the guys who run, uh, run the show where this was supposed to be deployed, and they said, no, it didn't, didn't go live. Um, the original reason for the software was because you know, we were planning on listing on an American stock exchange and we needed to be Solvance Oxley compliant. And then we decided not to list, but the software still seemed useful. But then it wasn't really possible to justify with the board to spend more money on it. So yeah, we decided not to do it. Like, but there were like 30 people working with me. We built an amazing product. I know you spent tens of millions of rands on this thing. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. If I'm lucky, there's a piece of spinning rust somewhere, still spinning. If that rust is still spinning, it's in a server that at midnight every night, the continuous integration server will run a build, and there will be a little train sound that goes... Because I know so no one's changed the code, and if the code had been changed, it might break, and it might go... Because that's what I did for myself so that I could get through the nights. So like at midnight, I'd hear the train because there was a build running across all these different people. And it looked CI build, and everything was right on that project. The contract fell through. We collaborated with the customer, but the contract fell through. 
So, insights from there, I mean, you'll draw your own, but that was like, in the, in the world of defining moments, a defining moment for me. Further compounded by the fact that the guy had started the business with, had realized that it was really nice working in that sort of structured environment, and this entrepreneurial thing wasn't really for him anymore. Let alone that we just lost that big contract and the airline that we were working for earlier had just gone under because we were in 2008 and their funders had gone under so they couldn't keep operating. So the business was in what might loosely be termed a crisis. Um, a crisis is like where you have to make a, a decision and you get quite stressed. Um, so the only thing that had helped me to get version 1.1 out the door well, a lot of things, but the one thing that I, I attribute most of my success to was this little book by Henrik Knuberg, which I had in the ebook, but I now have a physical copy because I like it so much, um, called Scrum and XP from the Trenches. So I was like, such a huge project, we managed to get it through using these techniques, but what else do we need to learn from there? And so, so it was hard, but you know, I sat down and I said, okay, let's figure out how we could build a company around these principles that helped. So. What helped? Starting with individuals and interactions over processes and tools. I had coffee with people. It helped me understand the system. 1.1, for all the fact that it doesn't exist in reality, was successful. Everyone wanted it and, and that was okay. Like, let's ignore the fact that it completely failed. We would still probably have been slaving there to this day building a system that didn't match because we would have been fighting a Sisyphean task to get people to sign off on something that didn't actually, wasn't actually meant to be built. So, and this is the, the biggie for me, is that we need to value collaboration on <coughs> the contract. Um, collaboration all the way through until it's released. You know, working with the people who will be using your software over just having a good, tight, contract. And probably the most important one for this project, working software over comprehensive documentation. Now remember that spec I told you about? The one I still haven't read. I kept two pages of it just as a memento. The rest has gone far away. The interesting thing is that these principles, has anyone heard them before? Anyone tell me where they come from? Agile Manifesto. Cool. Agilemanifesto.org. I'm not going to give you notes, but if there's one note, agilemanifesto.org. If you haven't heard about, if you didn't recognize these things, then you haven't really heard about Agile. You may have heard the word Agile used and drawn your own inferences on what it meant. I had to. I had no idea until things went wrong in this way. And to tell you briefly a story that's not my own about the Agile Manifesto, a bunch of guys trying to make software the way I was, failing, and ladies in the 80s and 90s, and they came up with lightweight methods. They were like, we don't want documentation, we, we need better documentation, too process heavy, because the natural response to failure is to add more of the things like contracts, to add more of the things like plans, to add more of the things like processes. A tool will fall, solve this problem. This is a natural response. We go for these tangible things. And it's especially a business response because you want the assets, right? You can bank your plan, you can bank um, a process description, you know you have a business there. <coughs> And so these guys all, and ladies all, thought about this problem. Eventually a bunch of guys decided that they could meet together at a ski ranch because, well, if you're going to meet, you might as well meet somewhere cool. And they were anarchists. And they met together and they realized that although they were calling things Scrum and XP and all these sorts of things, they had something in common. Something that at that time was called lightweight software. Anyone familiar with that term? No? Good. Um, because they decided that being called lightweight was bad. You don't want to be a lightweight attending a lightweight conference using lightweight. People just wouldn't take you seriously. <laughs> so instead, they came up with the word agile, which describes the same thing, but also adds in it the ability to change. And um, this ability to change is critically important. You know, this notion that when you're at the customer, 
and they say, can you integrate with Jeppesen on the last day? You don't say, that wasn't in the spec that we wrote. We would be near to do some extra work. You go, of course. You know? That responding to change, especially late in the cycle, is a competitive advantage. So we, we need to be able to... Yeah, sorry, it's back in here. Um, I'm very stickless, so responding to change. So, oh, it should be in here. Even more change. I didn't write one up. <laughs> so, responding to change over sticking to a plan. Um, the core cool thing about that is that I've just said you don't need a plan. Or at least that's what at least 70% of you have heard. You don't need a plan. And when I said working software over comprehensive do documentation, at least 70% of you will have heard you don't need docs. And you'll go out saying agile means we don't need documentation. Agile means we don't need plans, Agile means we don't need contracts, and Agile means we don't need processes, all those stinking tools. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean that at all. And if I think about what I would tell myself about like getting started, is the stuff on the right, the stuff that looks horrible, useless, plans, contracts, documentation, it's all software. It's not code. But it's software. I was reading this book by this, anyone heard of Peter Drucker? Wow, awesome. Read his books. They come from the 70s. They're really old. They're probably dusty copies in the libraries. But he talks about innovation and all sorts of business stuff. I mean, he's like, he invented the science of management essentially, I think. Um, maybe I'm going over the top there. But uh, Peter Drucker wrote a long time ago. And when I read his books, he said, well, in your business, you've got software and hardware. I was like, okay, cool. He said, the hardware is the filing cabinets and the buildings. The software is your processes. The software is your designs, your drawings, your contracts. That's the soft stuff that's easy to change. So I took that back and I went, okay, cool. Well, if it's software, maybe we should be hacking it. You know, if it's software, maybe we should be testing it. And the thing that, if you look at the Agile Manifesto, and I won't go through this exercise for you, if you look at the stuff on the right, the things we don't want is untested software. So if you run a plan, and you don't test it, and you don't refactor it when you encounter reality, then you've got defunct buggy software. So that kind of plan you don't want. Same, same token applies to contracts. My normal talks these days are about contracts, because for some reason I got to like law. But I decided that that wasn't appropriate today. The idea is that it's all software, and it's the software that runs your business. It's the software that fuels your entrepreneurship. How do you do things? You have software. Again, who codes here? Just so I can remember. Okay. Anyone code in something that has a REPL? Or a shell like Python or something like that? Ever written stuff at a command prompt or a Unix shell or something Bash. like that? Bash, yeah. So, for those who haven't, is to, like when you interact with a computer, you just type stuff and it does it. You, know, you type stuff and it does it. And you type stuff and it does it. And that stuff disappears, right? There might be some history here, but you type stuff and it does it. It's quite fantastic. It does, does anything it can do if you tell it to do it in the right way. So running a business, it's kind of the same. You, month starts, you do stuff. Month starts, you do stuff. Month starts, you do stuff. And at some point in the life of a software, of a computer player, you realize you actually want to script this stuff. You want to make programs out of it. And that for me was like, is a very interesting point that when you're doing business, you want to make programs out of it. You don't want to just be sitting there at the shell saying, you know, send invoice today. You want to be going, okay, and even if it isn't a document that says we send invoices on the 25th of the month, and we do this, um, we must have a contract signed with every customer, um, so that when you, when you run that, it can work. But why would that matter? Why do we want to make software and scripts? Why, why, why would you make software for a tech startup? Saves time. Saves time? What does that let you do? Make more money. Or spend your resources or your time resources into something else. Cool. And you make more money, you save time, and you get to scale. So we're very good at scaling software. 
we're very bad at scaling business because we don't treat it as software. If it's software that can be executed on people, on organizations, on whatever it is, then if you say, I'm making a site called Facebook, and someone's going to type in their name, and I'm going to be on the other side, receive that name, type it into another form, well, you're going to have about three users, right? Because maybe ten, if you're really fast at typing. Because when this person clicks on that, I'm going to then take that and send that to that other person. And at some point, you're going to write down what you do and hire a bunch of people to do that. And at some point, you're going to then automate what you wrote for those people. If you're smart. We don't do that for business, though. We don't write down what we do. When we're going to, before we do it in a meaningful way and validate that and run it like we would run software. So I thought today as something to take away as people who are in software thinking about entrepreneurship, thinking about businesses, how can you make code out of everything else you do and how can you hack it? If you're looking for reading, there's stuff on culture hacking out there, um, which is saying culture is software. Culture runs on groups of people. How do we hack our culture? What can we do to improve our culture? Experiment. Just try. Like, what if we say we have this type of thing? Does it make things better? And it makes it fun. It makes all parts of it fun. How do we hack our plans? And how do all of those things, if you look at the Agile Manifesto, which is the other thing to go look at, all the green things that are down there that we really want are idealistic. It's collaboration. It's working software. It's individuals and interactions. It's responding to change. So somehow, we can craft those software things that we need to support the space that we want. And we want that space. We want to stay idealistic and we want to stay young. We want to stay innovative. But those things quickly get tied down if we have to keep working in what is your contract? How are we, how are we doing this process? What are we doing if we don't have those there? And I don't know. I thought of this the other day, so it's like the most amazing thing in the world to me. So you'll, if you'll pardon me. We used to say measure twice, cut once. Has anyone heard that? If you think of a carpenter, you know, measure that piece of wood, cut it once. And I realized that somewhere along the line, that's no longer true. Because we work in software. It's cheap to cut. And because of build, measure, learn, we can't know until we put it in front of people. I spent a really long time trying to explain to the commercial department the system that they want. Until they looked at it, they couldn't tell me, oh, cool, that'd be great, can it do the Jefferson thing? If I'd drawn them on a sticky paper, it'll look like this. They'll say, oh, can you put the Jefferson number in there? I would've said, okay, I'll do it. And I wouldn't even have to come back to South Africa. You know, it would be done. And they would be happy. I'm happy it happened the way it happened, because I, I love living in Cape Town, but <coughs> if you can build smaller and measure smaller and learn smaller, then you know, we get to this place where we can measure and then we can cut and then we can measure again and then we can cut and then hey, we can measure again and then we can cut. But the important thing is, we've cut already, we're trying it out, and we're getting real data back. The same thing with our software that runs our businesses. There's all sorts of assumptions built into there. And the thing for me, for us to do, is to say, well, it's all software, our business, our business model, everything we do, including our code. How do we ship it really, really fast, get it in front of people, get that feedback, and you know, if we actually ship it and people are really, really, really using it, then we can really, really, really know what they're going to do with it. Um, not leave it on a piece of spilling rust in a server room somewhere. If I, if I could have shipped even one month of my work from there, I would have been happy. But I didn't. Um, so, yeah, for me, how do we stay idealistic? This isn't a talk about becoming realistic and boring. Today I'm saying, like, how do we keep that idealism? And I work every day to try to build an environment for myself and everyone who works with me that can keep our idealism alive, keep us experimental, trying new things, because that's the only way we're going to be able to learn and to build new things, even if it's like a thought experiment. 
How do we reward failure in building and measuring and learning? So, in the space of building, measure, learn, do it fast. Whenever you hear someone says you must build software fast, they don't mean build lots of software fast. They mean build it, ship it, learn it. That's, that's the thing for me. So, it's pithy. I have a lot more stories to tell, but I thought let's tell a few and maybe maybe one of them sticks with you and you're sitting on a hard day and you go, hmm, let's do something different. Let's maybe let myself be a bit more idealistic today. I'm feeling trapped. How do you break out? Because this is an innovation lab and we want to launch. So what a, you're in the right place for it. So that's me for today. Enjoy. Uh, if you have any Q&As for David, um, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. Another 10 minutes or so for Q&A. Cool. So, uh, Sorry. Um, impl implementing an agile process in a company that's already been not that focused, being yeah. pulled around on time, even taking a week down for a sprint, focusing on one thing. Mm. Any advice on how to get that in place? I really hated it when the old people used to tell me, and I'm feeling like an old person now when I give you this answer, so I'm going to give it to you, is that you need to learn to value the outcomes enough to make the, to make the point. So, so what do you get from that focus? What do you get from having a whole week focused on one thing? No, but there's all this slack, right? People are not going to be working the whole time, and people aren't going to be at 100% efficiency. But what do we have to value? We have to value that waste. We have to value trying different things because it's wasteful. Because that's the waste of innovation. You know, that's the thing for me. I, I coach Agile in organizations. This is my thing, right? Now, because I care about it enough. I, I go into Alan Gray and I like, help them do that thing. And it's, you need to say, a week is short. What if we could achieve something in a week? Normally, people are thinking about introducing Agile because stuff is feeling all over the place or crazy. So you say, well, let's look for the alternative. Let's look for the idealistic thing where we could be delivering working software. Could we deliver working software? Could we work together? Could we respond to the changes within that window? Whereas if you've been shred out and spread, you're, the idea started there, it finishes there, and it's very hard to respond to change. So it's hard to roll that whole thing up and put it into one week. And it's not easy. So I suppose my best advice would be to just try and don't do front don't try to do too much at once. Um, measure cut, measure cut. So that your culture and your team structure is your software that you're running at the moment. It feels buggy, it feels slow. Say, so, okay, well what would I like to introduce? And introduce one thing and test it. Like a weekly retrospective or a weekly review. Don't even say you have to stop for the whole week. You know, but if you can set that as a vision as you might value, then, then you might get there. But don't change too much at once because then you mess up your science. People are like, okay, you told us to do these 10 things, this car could go back. Do one thing, did it work or not? Yes, okay, we keep that thing. Do another thing, did it work or not? Keep that thing. Small, 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 small. To tie it back to my talks. Okay. Anything else? Or feeling idealistic? Um, just in terms of location, do you find Cape Town a nice environment to work in, but the business up in, but the business is all up in Hutting. You fly up most of the time, or and resources down here, resources up there. Um, that was a fantastic question, right? Um, up until the point where I sat down and I went, we're going to do agile stuff and make it work. I was always in Joburg. When I decided to do that, I said, okay, well, we're going to make weeks available, sell them to corporates, figure it out, but startups rushed in the back door and we started working with them and we worked with them ever since. Because they were like, oh, you're doing this stuff, we really want to do it that way, can we? And the corporates, I had to like, educate them and I couldn't. So now, all of, almost all of our business is either Cape Town startup scene, so that's great fun, yeah. or um, international startup scene. Um, but... Going to Joburg, yes, there, there's more business there. Uh, I'll give you a facetious answer to your resources question. 
because all of our resources like gold and stuff are in Joburg. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about people, they're not resources. Um, and there are people in both places and you don't need a lot of talent um, to run a software company. If you need hundreds of people, then maybe. But um, most of what we're doing needs a couple of bright people, which you should be able to find. Um, um, anyone heard of 37 Signals? Great software company. How many people do they employ? 16. They make lots of money all around the world. They have 16 people running on the lightweight process. We don't need lots and lots of people. So, but personally, I'm still <coughs> idealistic. Um, so I, I'm unreasonable. I choose to be in Cape Town. I think it's an amazing place. And I think the best thing about Cape Town that makes it beat Joburg completely, if not something silly at all, is the fact that the people down in Cape Town don't push so hard. So in Joburg, I was working 300 more months for crying out loud. Where am I going to find the time to get better? Cape Town, people like, want to go home at some point. Um, the weekends, there's things to do other than going to the mall. So people talk to each other, they interact. Um, we have events, more and more events like this are starting to happen in Joburg, but especially about five years ago, coming back to Cape Town and living in Cape Town full time was so beautiful because I found people were taking time out to have these events and talk to each other and network and figure stuff out. And that's where the value is generated. It's not generated in having lots and lots of large corporates to, to, make, to, to sell lots and lots of things to, because that's, that's a commodity war. Uh, with, it, it, for the innovation business, which I think many of us are in. So, yeah, that's a targeted answer. Thanks. Yeah. How are we doing? Uh, yeah. Just one uh, short question. Um, what's the best way that we found to uh, get the team aligned with a measure cut? Let's start with the worst way. Um, there's a great little comic. It's a, it's a bunch of depressed people walking into a meeting room. And then there's a CEO telling them the vision. And then afterwards, there's a bunch of depressed people walking out of the meeting room. And uh, the CEO says, I've shared my vision. Now we have a shared vision. That's not really what it is, right? Um, it, it's not one person telling everyone. So if you want to know what to measure, like figure something out, but with the team. And know that it's going to be not the thing you think is right, but if everybody wants to measure it, and you can measure it, and then you can build it, and it's small, like make it tiny. Make it like, I don't know, there's such tiny things you can do. If we draw this on paper, and we go to NLC, and we put it on a desk, and we ask the first you probably a group of guys, the first beautiful young girl who comes past to make it more fun, if she's going to go through this online dating site, you know, will she know what to do here? Because she's the person you want on your online dating site, right? That's why you're making it. So you ask them to go through it, and then you see, there's like, where do I put my picture? Oh, we didn't put a picture in here. Just your name's important, right? Your name and age and your dimensions, right? And your degree, and, um, you know... And I'd also like to know the marks you got in high school, because you know, I found that's been a good indicator for selection in our algorithm. Yeah. You know, you'll learn something there, right? Um, but you know, just get it in front of people. You'll surprise yourself. Like, you'll surprise yourself that people flipping wanted the Jefferson thing, right? If we could have drawn it for them on paper, so if you want the simplest thing to do, just draw something on paper and take it out of your building and go somewhere else. That would be my advice. You always learn something doing that. I've never, I've never felt like I've wasted my time coming up with a sketch and taking it out and showing it to someone. Whether that someone is the client, um, yeah, something else very important that you made me think about but just before I go. So there I was in Sweden at a conference and I got invited to join a panel of people talking about agile contracting because, you know, we value collaboration over contracts, so let's talk about contracting. Um, but anyway, and one of the people made a very, very interesting point there. Because when you're trying to contract for software, you're a dev, and that's reality. You speak different languages. Have you ever talked to someone in another language when you don't know that language? What do you do? Gesture a lot. You draw stuff. You show them, like, 
library book inside bus. I want to go there. So the, 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 the thing from there is when you speak a different language, you have to show. You can't tell. So for me, that's the essence of why the paper works. Because we speak a different language, we have to show people. We can't tell them. Um, and until we showed them the flight planning system, to harp on that simpler story, they didn't ask for Jefferson. Because, I don't know, either they assumed it would do it, but, um, yeah, that's my big learning at the moment. More and more pre-production. Before you go and build with the full team, I'm not worried about that anymore. I know we can build. I'm not worried about building the right thing. Um, and, yeah, you can do that for very cheap. Cool. Last question? Oh, yeah, time. Yeah? Oh. I have time for one, if there's one more question. Um, yeah, I was just wondering, uh, I think maybe what your answer now was, was in a way uh, maybe one of the biggest mistakes startups make, but do you have uh, any insight in what are the biggest mistakes they make in, in implementing Agile? Um, <coughs> or what are the things they struggle most with? So, was my answer a mistake? No, no I, I think your answer could have, uh, the question could have, you, uh, your answer could have been to the question what's the biggest mistake startups uh, make. Right, okay. Um, but maybe what, what are the biggest struggles with uh, implementing Agile? Could be the same answer. Okay. Um, but I'd say I was forced to do it what I believe quite a right way initially because when I looked at it I had to say what could I get away with? Let's try to change one thing at a time. And so it comes back to the songs. Just don't change everything at once mm -hmm. because then you lose your science. It's like if you're thinking about your code base, if you're like, it's not quite working, let's <coughs> implement this new pattern. You don't delete it all and go and make a new one. Things are there because they're working. We call it the second system effect. You know, We think we're going to get everything sorted the second time around. It's, no, that's, it's, no. So rather look into <coughs> So when I coach, we've got Scrum, XP, all of these things. They're all full of practices. And the people who've gone to the mountain and come back will tell you if you do all of those things, things will be perfect very hard to start doing all of those at once. But if they're toolboxes and you can take one out and try it, just know that in isolation, it's going to make all your other stuff hard. Because the first retrospective you're going to have, people are going to complain about everything else. About not having plans, about not... So if you do them in isolation, it makes everything else look rather cut. Um, someone once said to me that Scrum in particular is like your mother-in-law. If you invite it into your house, it's going to point out your faults. But why do we invite our mother-in-law into our house? Because our mother-in-law is quite closely related to our spouse. And the things that, make our, that our mother-in-law points out will make our spouse happier. So in the same way, when Scrum comes in, it's going to go, ah, 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 all these things are wrong. It doesn't mean the mother-in-law is bad. It means the things are wrong and you make them right and actually both of you will have a happier home. Um, so when you start trying to do Agile stuff, it looks like everything is wrong. And it's kind of like taking your head out of the sand as a false place. Look around, you know, Ooh, put it back in, you know. No, but if you can, look, you know, maybe it'll work. <laughs> okay, cool. thanks so much, David, for your time. Um, so, yeah, let's give a big hand to David. Thanks.